Hi, today I'm going to teach you basic game programming concepts really quickly using Scratch. I suggest you try to follow along if you're able to. Just go to the Scratch website and create a project. Alright, let's get started. Here's the game screen, here's where the code is gonna go, and here is all the programming blocks you'll use to code. In the motion section, click and drag the change x by 10 block into that big empty area. Now click on it. You'll notice that the cat has moved a little to the right. Now click on the 10 and change the number to let's say minus 15. Now he's moving to the left. And faster because 15 is bigger than 10. Now grab the change y by 10 block and click on it. Now the cat is moving up. Change the value to negative 5 and would you look at that, the cat is moving down. He's moving slowly because 5 is smaller than 10. Make sense? Alright. Now let's talk about loops. Go into the control section, grab the forever block and put the change x block in it. Now click on it. Now the cat is moving to the left forever. Cool. So now let's bring him back to the center. Stop the loop, then you can either drag him back to the center or manually change his coordinates or better yet, use the set x and the set y blocks to reset his position. Programming is all about finding your own solutions. But we don't want to manually reset his position every time. So in the events section, we'll grab the when flag clicked block and put it above the set x and set y to zero blocks. Those two buttons above the game screen lets you start and stop the game. But keep in mind that the flag button won't do anything unless you tell the program to do something when you click on it. Alright, now let's add some user inputs. Go into the control section, grab the if then block, go into the sensing section, grab the key space pressed block, and change space to left arrow. Put it in the if block, then put that inside the forever block, then put another when flag clicked block on top. Now, when we start the game, the cat is put in the center, and when you press the left key, it moves to the left. Now we can copy and paste that three times and change the blocks a little to make it work in all four directions. Isn't that great? Now, I think he's moving a little too fast, so let's change the value. We could manually change the number four different times, or we could use a variable. Go in the variable section, make a new variable, and call it speed. Now we'll set speed to 10. Now grab the variable and put it instead of the 15s. If you test it now, you'll see that you can't go left or down anymore. That is because, if you remember, you need a negative number to go left and down. So, we'll go in the operator section and do speed times negative 1. Now, if you want to change the speed, you only need to change one value. This is the difference between hard coding and soft coding. Alright, now that we have a player, let's make a collectible. Create a new sprite and draw like a coin or something, I don't care. Then we can do forever, go to a random position, then wait until touching sprite 1, then increase a new score variable by 1. Now when you touch the coin, the score goes up by 1 and the coin teleports somewhere else. But sometimes the coin randomly spawns on top of the cat. So to fix that, we'll do repeat until not touching sprite 1, go to a random position. So now if it spawns on a cat, it'll try to go somewhere else until it's not touching it. Okay, now let's add an enemy, make a new sprite, and then we're gonna make it follow the cat. An easy way to do that would be to use the move steps block. It makes a sprite move in the direction of its angle. Using the point towards block, you can set the angle to point in the direction of another sprite. By combining those two, we can make the enemy sprite follow the player sprite. If you don't want the sprite to actually rotate, you can change the rotation style. This is a little simple though, so to make things more interesting, we can use the repeat block to control how often and he changes directions. Or we could also make it move towards the coin. So now the enemy is like guarding the coin or something. Then we just have to check if it's touching the player, and if so, stop the game. If you think that's too harsh, we could always add a lives counter. Make a new variable, call it lives, set it to whatever you want, decrease by 1 when touching the player, and stop the game when lives equal 0. If you test it now, you'll see that you instantly lose all of your lives if you touch the enemy. So we need to add a cooldown. A simple wait one second second block should do the trick. And there you have it, we have a game. Pretty easy, right? Next, I'd like to show you how we can improve the code for the movement using a secret technique. Grab this key up arrow pressed block. If you click on it, it says false, and if you hold the up arrow key and click again, it says true. This is called a boolean value. Now what's cool about them is that you can actually use these in calculations. False is equal to 0 and true is equal to 1. This means that you can do change y by key up arrow pressed times speed. So now when up isn't pressed, 
y gets changed by 0 times 10 or 0. And if up is pressed, y gets changed by 1 times 10 or 10. Use that same logic for all four directions, and now we have the exact same controls using much less space. Now we can take this one step further and create smooth movements. I'll start with only the x-axis to make things simpler to understand. To make smooth movements, we'll need three new variables. X velocity, acceleration, and friction. Next, instead of using the arrow keys to control the x position, we'll use the arrow keys to control the velocity, which then controls the position. And then we'll multiply by the acceleration variable, which I'm gonna set to 4. Next, we're gonna need to add a speed cap. We can simply check if the right arrow is pressed, and the x velocity is smaller than the max speed. Only when those two things are true will the velocity increase. So when the velocity is no longer smaller than the max speed, you will stop accelerating. For the left side, we check if the x velocity is bigger than speed times negative 1. And finally, we can add friction. If the x velocity is smaller than 0, we'll change the x velocity by the friction, which I'll set to 2. And if the velocity is bigger than 0, we'll change x velocity by friction times negative 1. Great, now we have smooth controls in one dimension. To get it working in two dimensions, we can simply make a y velocity variable, and then copy and paste everything, and replace all the x velocity with y velocity, right with up, and left with down. And now you have smooth controls with customizable parameters. Look, if you lower the acceleration and friction, you'll get slippery ice physics. Now, do keep in mind, this isn't the only way to do this. You could also just use a bunch of if statements if you think that's easier to understand. But that looks a lot less elegant, don't you think? Anyway, now that we've covered our basics, let's do a little challenge. I'm gonna show you how to make the No Internet Dinosaur game as fast as humanly possible. Ready, set, go. Start by making a score and a velocity variable. When flag clicked, set position to over there. Then forever, change y by velocity, then change velocity by minus 6. This is what causes gravity. If y position is lower than negative 120, set y to negative 120. This is what creates the floor for the cat to land on. If key space is pressed and y is equal to negative 120, set velocity to 45. We check to make sure the cat is touching the ground so that you can't jump in midair. Then make a new sprite. Draw a cactus with some random ovals. Then do when flag clicked forever, go to the far right edge of the screen. Then glide over to the left edge and randomize the time a little. Back to sprite 1, if touching sprite 2, end the game. Change the score by 1, reset the score at the start, and we're done. Did you get all that? I'm sure you did. Now, of course, this lacks any sort of polish whatsoever, but my goal here is to show you just how quickly you can make a prototype on Scratch. Alright, now, there's still quite a few scratch features I have yet to explain, so let's go over some of them real quick. There is what scratch calls messages, which lets you send signals between sprites, like if you wanted a victory screen to appear only when the player touches the goal. There's also clones, that allows you to create multiple instances of a sprite, which is really useful for making things like bullets. And finally, there's the custom blocks, which is really just the scratch equivalent of a function. If you don't know what a function is, remember earlier when we used a variable so that we only needed to change a number once instead of four separate times? Well, a function is kinda like the same thing, except that instead of a number, it's blocks of code. It allows you to reuse the same code in multiple places. And if you want to make a change, you only need to do so in one place. Alright, well, that's about all the time I've got for you today. Hopefully, you've learned a thing or two about programming on Scratch. And here's one final tip before I leave. If you ever find yourself bored on a project, try to ask yourself, what happens if I do this? For example, what happens if I make this number really big? Or really small? What if I make it negative? What happens if I remove this block? Play around with things like that, try to predict what's gonna happen. And if you don't get the result you expected, try to understand why that is. So, what are you waiting for? Go make a game on Scratch. Do it. Do it. Do it. <laughs>